Section 2. The Order of Simulacra. The Three Orders of Simulacra. There are three orders of simulacra, running parallel to the successive mutations of the law of value since the Renaissance. The counterfeit is the dominant schema in the classical period, from the Renaissance to the Industrial Revolution. Production is the dominant schema in the Industrial Era. Simulation is the dominant schema in the current code-governed phase. The first order simulacrum operates on the natural law of value, the second order simulacrum on the market law of value, and the third order simulacrum on the structural law of value. The stucco angel, the counterfeit, and, simultaneously, fashion, is born with the renaissance, with the destructuration of the feudal order by the bourgeois order and the emergence of overt competition at the level of signs of distinction. There is no fashion in a caste society, nor in a society based on rank, since assignation is absolute and there is no class mobility. Signs are protected by a prohibition which ensures their total clarity and confers an unequivocal status on each. Counterfeit is not possible in the ceremonial, unless in the form of black magic and sacrilege, which is precisely what makes the mixing of signs punishable as a serious offense against the very order of things. If we take to dreaming once more particularly today of a world where signs are certain, of a strong symbolic order, let's be under no illusions. For this order has existed, and it was a brutal hierarchy, since the sign's transparency is indissociably also its cruelty. In feudal or archaic caste societies, in cruel societies, signs are limited in number and their circulation is restricted. Each retains its full value. As a prohibition, and each carries with it a reciprocal obligation between castes, clans, or persons, so signs are not arbitrary. The arbitrariness of the sign begins when, instead of bonding two persons in an inescapable reciprocity, the signifier starts to refer to a disenchanted universe of the signified, the common denominator of the real world, towards which no one any longer has the least obligation. The end of the obligatory sign is succeeded by the reign of the Page 50 Page 51 Emancipated sign, in which any and every class will be able to participate. Competitive democracy succeeds the Endogamy of signs proper to status-based orders. With the transit of values or signs of prestige from one class to another, we simultaneously and necessarily enter into the age of the counterfeit. For from a limited order of signs, the free production of which is prevented by a prohibition, we pass into a proliferation of signs according to demand. These multiple signs, however, no longer have anything to do with the restricted circulation of the obligatory sign, but counterfeit the latter. Counterfeiting does not take place by means of changing the nature of an original, but, by extension, through completely altering a material whose clarity is completely dependent upon a restriction. Non-discriminatory the sign is nothing any longer if not competitive, relieved of every constraint, universally available, the modern sign nevertheless still simulates necessity by giving the appearance that it is bound to the world. The modern sign dreams of its predecessor, and would dearly love to rediscover an obligation in its reference to the real. It finds only a 
reason, a referential reason, a real and a natural on which it will feed. This designatory bond, however, is only a simulacrum of symbolic obligation, producing nothing more than neutral values which are exchanged one for the other in an objective world. Here the sign suffers the same fate as labor, for just as the free worker is only free to produce equivalents, the free and emancipated sign is only free to produce equivalent signifieds. The modern sign then finds its value as the simulacrum of a nature. This problematic of the natural and the metaphysics of reality was, for the bourgeoisie since the Renaissance, the mirror of both the bourgeois and the classical sign. Even Today there is a thriving nostalgia for the natural referent of the sign, despite several revolutions which have begun to shatter this configuration, such as the revolution of production when signs ceased to refer to a nature and referred instead to the law of exchange, passing into the market law of value. We will come back to these second order simulacra. It is with the Renaissance, then, that the forgery is born along with the natural, ranging from the deceptive finery on people's backs to the prosthetic fork, from the stucco interiors to Baroque theatrical scenery. The entire classical era was the age of the theater par excellence. The theater is a form that gripped social life in its entirety as well as all architecture. From the Renaissance on. From these incredible achievements with stucco and Baroque art we can unravel the. Metaphysics of the counterfeit, as well as the new ambitions of Renaissance man. These latter consist in an earthly. Demiurgy the transubstantiation of all nature into a single substance, a theatrical sociality unified under the sign of bourgeois values, beyond differences of blood, rank or caste. Stucco is the triumphant democracy of all artificial signs. The apotheosis of the theater and fashion, revealing the unlimited potential of the new class, as soon as it was able to end. The sign's exclusivity. The way is clear for unheard of. Page 51. Page 52. Combinations, for every game, every counterfeit the Promethean designs of the bourgeoisie are first engrossed in the imitation of nature, before it throws itself into production. In the churches and palaces, stucco embraces all forms, imitates all materials, velvet curtains, wooden cornices, and fleshy curves of the body. Stucco transfigures all this incredible material disorder into a single new substance, a sort of general equivalent for all the others, accruing a theatrical prestige since it is itself a representative substance, a mirror of all the others. But simulacra do not consist only of the play of signs, they involve social relations and a social power. Stucco may appear to be extolling the expansion of science and technology, but it is also and especially bound to the Baroque, which is in turn bound to the matter of the counter-reformation and to the hegemony of the political and mental world which, for the first time, the Jesuits try to institute in accordance with the modern conception of power. There is a direct relation between the Jesuits' mental obedience, perinda ac cadaver, and the demiurgic ambition to exorcise the natural substance of things in order to replace it with a synthetic substance. Just as man submits to organization, so things take on the ideal functionality of the corpse. Technology and technocracy are already fully 
operative in the notion of an ideal counterfeit of the world, expressed in the invention of a universal substance and a universal cominatory of substances. To reunify the world, split asunder after the Reformation, under a homogeneous doctrine, to universalize the world under a single word, from New Spain to Japan, the missions, to constitute a state. Political elite with one and the same centralist strategy, such are the Jesuits' objectives. To do this, they will need to create efficient simulacra, such as the organization's apparatus, as well as bureaucratic, theatrical, the great theater of the cardinals and the gray eminences, training and educational machinery, which aims, for the first time in a systematic fashion, to fashion an ideal nature on the model of the child. The stucco cladding of Baroque architecture is a major apparatus of the same order. All this issues from the productivist rationality of capital, but it already bears witness, not in production but in the counterfeit, to the same project of universal control and hegemony, to a social schema in whose foundations the internal coherence of a system already operates. In the Ardennes there used to live an old cook for whom the construction of tiered cakes and the science of patisserie sculpture had given him the arrogance to attempt to capture the world as God had left it, that is, in its natural state, to eliminate all its organic spontaneity and replace it with a single polymorphous material, reinforced concrete. Concrete Furniture, chairs, chests of drawers, concrete sewing machines, and outside, in the courtyard, an entire orchestra, including the violins, in concrete. Everything in concrete. Concrete trees planted out with genuine leaves, a reinforced concrete bore with a real boar's skull inside it, concrete sheep covered in real wool. At last Camille Renault discovered the original. Page 52 Page 53 Substance, the pastry from which the diversity of things are distinguished solely by realistic nuances such as the boars, skull and the leaves on the trees. Doubtless, however, this was only a concession from the demiurge to his visitors, for it was with a delighted smile that this good eighty-year-old god welcomed them to his creation. He sought no quarrel with divine creation, he simply remodeled it in order to make it more intelligible. There was no Luciferian revolt, no will to parody nor a partisan and retro affinity with naive art. The Arden cook simply reigned over a unified mental substance, for concrete is a mental substance, like the concept, it enables phenomena to be ordered and separated at will. His project was not so far removed from the stucco builders of Baroque art, nor very different from projecting an urban community onto the terrain of a large contemporary group. The counterfeit still only works on substance and form, not yet on relations and structures, but at this level, it is already aiming at control of a pacified society, cast in a synthetic substance which evades death, an indestructible artifact that will guarantee eternal power. Isn't it a miracle that with plastics, man has invented an undegradable matter, thus interrupting the cycle which through corruption and death reverses each and every substance on the earth into another? Even fire leaves an indestructible residue of this substance outside the cycle. Here is something we did not expect, 
a simulacrum in which the project of a universal semiotics is condensed. This has no longer anything to do with the progress of technology or the rational aims of science. It is a project which aims at political and mental hegemony, the fantasy of a closed mental substance like the Baroque stucco. Angels whose wingtips touch in a curved mirror. The automaton and the robot. A world separates these two artificial beings. One is the theatrical, mechanical, and clockwork counterfeit of man where the technique is to submit everything to analogy and to the simulacrum effect. The other is dominated by a technical principle where the machine has the upper hand, and where, with the machine, equivalence is established. The automaton plays the man of the court, the socialite, it takes part in the social and theatrical drama of pre-revolutionary France. As for the robot, as its name implies, it works, end of the theater, beginning of human mechanics. The automaton is the analogon of man and remains responsive to him, even playing drafts with him. The machine is the equivalent of man, appropriating him to itself as an equal in the unity of a functional process. This sums up the difference between first and second order simulacra. We must not be fooled by figurative resemblance. Like God, the automaton questions nature, if not the mystery of the soul, the dilemma of being and appearance, what underlies nature, what is within us, what is. Page 53 Page 54 Behind Appearances Only the counterfeit of man allows these questions to be asked. Every metaphysics of man as the protagonist in the natural theater of creation is embodied in the automaton before disappearing with the French Revolution, and the automaton has no other destiny than to be compared with the living man with the aim of being more natural than him whose ideal image the automaton is. The automaton is man's perfect double, even down to the subtlety of its gestures, in the workings of its organs and intelligence, almost inducing anxiety when we perceive that there is no difference between them, and that therefore the automaton has no need of a soul since it possesses an ideally naturalist body. Because this would be sacrilege, the difference between them is still maintained, as in the case of an automaton so perfect that on stage the illusionist mimicked its staccato movements in order that at least, even if the roles were reversed, confusion would be impossible. Thus the automaton's questions remain open, making it an optimistic mechanics, even if the counterfeit always retains a diabolical connotation. 1. There is nothing like this with the robot. The robot no longer questions appearances, its only truth is its mechanical efficiency. It no longer needs to resemble man, to whom it is inevitably compared. The infamous metaphysical difference which gives the automaton mystery and charm no longer exists, the robot emphasizes this difference for its own benefit. Being and appearance are founded on a single substance of production and labor. The first order simulacrum never abolishes the difference, it presupposes the dispute always in evidence between the simulacrum and the real, a particularly subtle game in trompe or painting, but all art thrives on this difference. The second order simulacrum simplifies the problem by the absorption of appearances, or by the liquidation of the real, whichever you prefer. In any 
case it erects a reality without images, without echo, without mirrors, without appearances, such indeed is labor, such is the machine, such is the entire industrial system of production in that it is radically opposed to the principle of theatrical illusion. No more semblance or dissemblance, no more God or man, only an imminent logic of the principle of operativity. After this, robots and machines can proliferate this is even their law as automata, being sublime and singular. Mechanisms, have never done. Men themselves only began to proliferate when, with the industrial revolution, they took on the status of machines, freed of all semblance, freed even from their double, they grew increasingly similar to the system of production of which they were nothing more than the miniaturist equivalent. The simulacrum's revenge, which gave rise to the myth of the sorcerer's apprentice, did not take place with the automaton, on the contrary, this is the law of the second order, from which there still proceeds a hegemony of the robot, of the machine, of dead labor over living labor. This hegemony is necessary to the cycle of production and reproduction. It is with this reversal that we leave the counterfeit in order to enter into re-production. We are leaving natural law and its play of page 54 page 55 forms in order to enter the market law of value and its calculations of forces the industrial simulacrum a new generation of signs and objects arises with the industrial revolution signs with no caste tradition that will never have known restrictions on their status and which will never have to be counterfeits since from the outset they will be products on a gigantic scale. The problem of their specificity and their origin is no longer posed, technics is their origin. They have meaning only within the dimension of the industrial simulacrum. That is, the series, the very possibility of two or an identical objects. The relation between them is no longer one of an original and its counterfeit, analogy or reflection, but is instead one of equivalence and indifference. In the series, objects become indistinct simulacra of one another and, along with objects, of the men that produce them. The extinction of the original reference alone facilitates the general law of equivalences, that is to say, the very possibility of production. The entire analysis of production will be swept aside if we stop regarding it as an original process, as the process at the origin of all the others, but conversely as a process which reabsorbs every original being and introduces a series of identical beings. Up to this point, we have considered production and labor as potential, as force and historical process. As a generic activity, an energetic economic myth proper to modernity. We must ask ourselves whether production is not rather an intervention, a particular phase, in the order of signs whether it is basically only one episode in the line of simulacra that episode of producing an infinite series of potentially identical beings, object signs, by means of technics. The fabulous energies at work in technics, industry, and economics should not hide the fact that it is at bottom only a matter of attaining this indefinite reproducibility, which is a definite challenge to the natural order, and ultimately only a second-order simulacrum and a somewhat weak imaginary solution to the question of world mastery. In relation to the era of the counterfeit, the double, 
the mirror and the theater, games of masks and appearances, the serial and technical era of reproduction is basically an era of less ambitious scope, the following era of simulation models and third order. Simulacra is of much more considerable dimensions. Walter Benjamin, in the work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction in Illuminations, T.R. Harry Zahn, ed. Hannah Arendt, London, Jonathan Cape, 1970, was the first to draw out the essential implications of the principle of reproduction. He shows that reproduction absorbs the process of production, changes its goals, and alters the status of the product and the producer. He shows this in the fields of art, cinema, and photography, because it is there that new Territories are opened up in the page 55, page 56, 20th century, with no classical tradition of productivity, placed from the outset under the sign of reproduction. Today, however, we know that all material production remains within the same sphere. Today we know that it is at the level of reproduction, fashion, the media, advertising, information, and communications networks, at the level of what Marx rather carelessly used to call the faux phrase of capital, immense historical irony, that is, in the sphere of simulacra, and the code, that the unity of the whole process of capital is formed. Benjamin was also the first, with McLuhan after him, to grasp technology as a medium rather than a productive force, at which point the Marxian analysis retreats, as the form and principle of an entirely new generation of meaning. The mere fact that any given thing can simply be reproduced, as such, in an exemplary double is already a revolution, one need only think of the stupefaction of the black boy seeing two identical books for the first time. That these two technical products are equivalent under the sign of necessary social labor is less important in the long term than the serial repetition of the same object, which is also the serial repetition of individuals as labor power. Technique as a medium gains the upper hand not only over the product's message, its use value, but also over labor power, which Marx wanted to turn into the revolutionary message of production. Benjamin and McLuhan saw more clearly than Marx, they saw that the real message, the real ultimatum, lay in reproduction itself. Production itself has no meaning, its social finality is lost in the series. Simulacra prevail over history. Moreover, the stage of serial reproduction, that of the industrial mechanism, the production line, the growth of reproduction, etc., is ephemeral. As soon as dead labor gains the upper hand over living labor, that is to say, since the end of primitive accumulation, serial production gives way to generation through models. In this case it is a matter of a reversal of origin and end, since all forms change from the moment that they are no longer mechanically reproduced, but conceived according to their very reproducibility, their diffraction from a generative core called a model. We are dealing with third-order simulacra here. There is no more counterfeiting of an original, as there was in the first order, and no more pure series as there were in the second, there are models from which all forms proceed according to modulated differences. Only affiliation to the model has any meaning, 
since nothing proceeds in accordance with its end any more, but issues instead from the model, the signifier of reference, functioning as a foregone, and the only credible. Conclusion We are dealing with simulation in the modern sense of the term, where industrialization is only its initial form. Modulation is ultimately more fundamental than serial reproducibility, distinct oppositions more than quantitative equivalences, and the commutation of terms more than the law of equivalences, the structural, not the market, law of value. Not only do we not need to search for the secrets of the code in technique or economics, it is on the contrary the very possibility of industrial production that we must. Page 56 Page 57 Seek in the genesis of the code and the simulacrum. Every order subs amess the previous order. Just as the order of the counterfeit was captured by the order of serial reproduction, look at how art passed entirely into machinality, so the Entire order of production is in the process of toppling into operational simulation. The analyses of both Benjamin and McLuhan stand on the borders of reproduction and simulation, at the point where referential reason disappears and production is seized by vertigo. These analyses mark a decisive advance over Veblen and Goblot, who, describing for example, the signs of fashion still refer to a classical configuration where signs constitute a distinct material having a finality and are used for prestige, status, and social differentiation. The strategy they deploy is contemporaneous with Marx's strategy of profit and commodity, at a moment where they could still speak of a use value of the sign or quite simply of economics at all, because there was still a reason of the sign and a reason of production. The Metaphysics of the Code The mathematically-minded Leibniz saw in the mystical elegance of the binary system where only the zero and the one count, the very image of creation. The unity of the Supreme Being, operating by means of a binary function against the Nothing, was sufficient ground, he thought, from which all things could be made. Marshall McLuhan The great man-made simulacra pass from a universe of natural laws into a universe of forces and tensions, and today pass into a universe of structures and binary oppositions. After the metaphysics of being and appearance, after energy and determinacy, the metaphysics of indeterminacy and the code. Cybernetic control, generation through models. Differential modulation, feedback, question slash answer, etc., this is the new operational configuration, industrial simulacra. Being mere operations. Digitality is its metaphysical principle, Leibniz God, and DNA is its prophet. In fact, it is in the genetic code that the genesis of simulacra today finds its completed form. At the limits of an ever more forceful extermination of references and finalities, of a loss of semblances and designators, we find the digital, programmatic sign which has a purely tactical value, at the intersection of other signals, bits of information slash tests, and which has the structure of a micromolecular code of command and control. At this level, the question of signs and their rational destinations, their real and their imaginary, their repression, reversal, the illusions they form of what they silence or of their parallel significations, is completely effaced. We have 
already seen the signs of the first order, complex signs with a wealth of illusion, change with the advent of machines into crude, dull, industrial, repetitive, echoless, functional and efficient signs. There is a still more radical mutation as regards the code signals, which become illegible, and for which no possible interpretation can be provided, buried. Page 57 Page 58 Like programmatic matrices, light years, ultimately, from the biological body, black boxes where every command and response are in ferment. End of the theater of representation, the space of the conflicts and silences of the sign, only the black box of the code remains, the molecule emitting signals which irradiate us, networking questions slash answers through us. As identifying signals, and continuously tested by the program we have hardwired into our own cells. Whether it is prison cells, electronic cells, party cells, or microbiological cells we are dealing with, we are always searching for the smallest indivisible element, the organic synthesis of which will follow in accordance with the givens of the code. The code itself is nothing other than a genetic, generative cell where the myriad intersections produce all the questions and all the possible solutions from which to select, for whom. There is no finality to these questions, informational signals, impulses, other than the response which is either genetic and immutable or inflected with minuscule and aleatory differences. Even space is no longer linear or unidimensional but cellular, indefinitely generating the same signals like the lonely and repetitive habits of a stir-crazy prisoner. The genetic code is the perpetual jump in a floppy disk, and we are nothing more than VDU cellules to lecture. The whole aura of the sign and signification itself is determinately resolved, everything is resolved into inscription and decoding. Such is our third-order simulacrum, such is the mystical elegance of the binary system of zero and one, from which all beings issue. Such also is the status of the sign at the end of signification, DNA or operational simulation. This is all perfectly summed up by Thomas Sebiak in Genetics and Semiotics, versus Innumerable observations confirm the hypothesis that the internal world of the organic descends directly from the primordial forms of life. The most remarkable fact is the omnipresence of the DNA molecule. The genetic material of all the Earth's known organisms is in large part composed of the nucleic acids DNA and RNA, whose Structure contains information transmitted through reproduction from one generation to the next, and furthermore, endowed with the capacity to reproduce itself and to imitate. In short, the genetic code is universal, or almost. Decoding it was an immense discovery to the extent that it showed that the two languages of the great polymers the languages of nucleic acid and protein, correlate directly. The Soviet mathematician Lyapunov demonstrated in 1963 that every living system transmits a small but precise quantity of energy or matter containing a great volume of information through channels laid down in advance. This information is responsible for the subsequent control of large quantities of energy and matter. From this perspective numerous biological and cultural phenomena, storing, feedback, channeling messages and so on, can be conceived as manifestations of 
Information Processing In the final analysis, information appears in large part to be the repetition of information. But still another kind of information, a kind of control which seems to be a universal property of terrestrial life. Irrespective of its form or substance. Five years ago I drew attention to the convergence of genetics and linguistics as autonomous but parallel disciplines in the larger field of the science of communication, which is also a part of zoosemiotics. The Terminology of Page 58 Page 59 Genetics is full of expressions taken from linguistics and communication theory, which emphasized both the principal similarities and the important differences in the structure and function of genetic and verbal codes. Today it is clear that the genetic code must be considered as the most basic semiotic network, and therefore as the prototype of all the other systems of signification used by the animals, including man. From this point of view, molecules, which are systems of quanta of, and which act as stable vehicles of physical information, zoosemiotic, and cultural systems including language, constitute a continuous chain of stages, with ever more complex energy levels, in the context of a unique and universal evolution. It is therefore possible to describe both language or living systems from a unifying cybernetic point of view. For the moment, this is only a useful and provisional analogy. A reciprocal rapprochement between genetics, animal communication, and linguistics may lead to a Complete science of the dynamics of semiosis, which science may turn out, in the final analysis, to be nothing other than a definition of life. So the outline of the current strategic model emerges, everywhere taking over from the great ideological model which political economy was in its time. We find this again, under the rigorous sign of science, in Jacques Monod's Chance and Necessity T.R. Austin Wayne House London, Collins, 1970 The End of Dialectical Evolution Life is now ruled by the discontinuous indeterminacy of the genetic code, by the teleonomic principle. Finality is no longer at the end, there is no more finality, nor any determinacy. Finality is there in advance, inscribed in the code. We can see that nothing has changed the order of ends has ceded its place to molecular play, as the order of signifieds has yielded to the play of infinitesimal signifiers, condensed into their aleatory commutation. All the transcendental finalities are reduced to an instrument panel. This is still to make recourse. To nature however, to an inscription in a biological nature, a phantasm of nature in fact, as it has always been, no longer. A metaphysical sanctuary for the origin and substance, but this time, for the code. The code must have an objective basis. What better than molecules and genetics? Mono is the strict theologian of this molecular transcendence, Edgar. More in its ecstatic supporter, DNA equals Adonai. In each of them, however, the phantasm of the code, which is equivalent to the reality of power, is confused with the idealism of the molecule. Again we find the hallucination or illusion of a world reunited under a single principle a homogeneous substance. According to the Counter-Reformation Jesuits, with Leibniz and his binary deity as their precursor, the technocrats of the 
biological, as well as the linguistic, sciences opt for the genetic code, for their intended program has nothing to do with genetics, but is a social and historical program. Biochemistry hypostatuses the ideal of a social order governed by a kind of genetic code, a macromolecular calculus by the PPBS, planning programming budgeting system, its operational circuits radiating over the social body. Here techno-cybernetics finds its natural philosophy, as Mono said. The biological and the biochemical have always exerted a fascination, ever since the beginnings of science. In Spencer's Organicism, Biosociologism Page 59 Page 60 It was operative at the level of second and third order structures, following Jacob's classification in the logic of life. Harman Swarth, Penguin, 1989, while today, in modern biochemistry, this applies to the level of fourth order. Structures Coded similarities and dissimilarities, the exact image of cyberneticist social exchange. We need only add the stereospecific complex to re-inject the intracellular communication that Morin will transform into a molecular eros. Practically and historically, this means that social control by means of the end, and the more or less dialectical providence that ministers to the fulfillment of this end, is replaced with social control by means of prediction, simulation, programmed anticipation and indeterminate mutation, all governed, however, by the code, instead of a process finalized. In accordance with its ideal development, we are dealing with generative models. Instead of prophecy, we fall subject to inscription. There is no radical difference between the two. Only the schemata of control change and, it has to be said, reach a fantastic degree of perfection. From a capitalist productivist society to a neo-capitalist cybernetic order, aiming this time at absolute control, the biological theory of the code has taken up arms in the service of this mutation. Far from indeterminate, this mutation is the outcome of an entire history where God, man, progress and even history have successively passed away to the advantage of the code, where the death of transcendence benefits immanence, which corresponds to a far more advanced phase of the vertiginous manipulation of social relations. In its infinite reproduction, the system puts an end to the myth of its origin and to all the referential values it has itself secreted in the course of its process. By putting an end to the myth of its origin, it puts an end to its internal contradictions, there is no longer a real or a referential to which to oppose them, and also puts an end to the myth of its end, the revolution itself. With the revolution you could still make out the outline of a victorious human and generic reference, the original potential of man. But what if capital wiped generic man himself off the map, in favor of genetic man? The revolution's golden age was the age of capital, where myths of the origin and the end were still in circulation. Once these myths were short-circuited, the only threat that capital had ever faced historically came from this mythical demand for rationality which pervaded it from the start, in a de facto operationality, a non-discursive operationality once. It became its own myth or rather an indeterminate, aleatory machine, something like a social genetic code capital no. 
longer left the slightest opportunity for a determinate reversal. This is the real violence of capital. However, it remains to be seen whether this operationality is itself a myth, whether DNA is itself a myth. This effectively poses the problem of the discursive status of science once and for all. In Mono, this discourse is so candidly absolutist that it provides a perfect opportunity for posing the problem. Page 60. Page 61. Plato, Heraclitus, Hegel, Marx. These ideological edifices, represented as a priory, were in reality a posteriori. Constructions designed to justify preconceived ethico-political theories. For science, objectivity is the only a priory postulate of objectivity, which spares, or rather forbids it from taking part in this debate. Chance and Necessity, p. 98. However, this postulate is itself a result of the never-innocent decision to objectify the world and the real. In fact, it postulates the coherence of a specific discourse, and scientificity is doubtless only the space of this discourse, never manifest as such, whose simulacrum of objectivity covers over this political and strategic speech. Besides, Mono clearly expresses the arbitrariness of this discourse a little further on. It may be asked, of course, whether all the invariants, conservations, and symmetries that make up the texture of scientific discourse are not fictions substituted for reality in order to obtain a workable image. A logic itself, founded upon a purely abstract, perhaps conventional, principle of identity a convention with which, however, human reason seems to be incapable of doing without. Ibid, p. 99. We couldn't put it more clearly, science itself determines its generative formula and its discourse model on the basis of a faith in a conventional order, and moreover not just any order, but the order of a total reduction. But Mono quickly glosses over this dangerous hypothesis of conventional identity. A rigid basis would serve science better, an objective reality for example. Physics will testify that identity is not only a postulate, but that it is in things, since there is an absolute identity of two atoms when they are found to be in the same quantitative state. So, is it convention or is it objective reality? The truth is that science, like any other discourse, is organized on the basis of a conventional logic, but, like any other ideological discourse, requires a real, objective reference within the processes of substance in order to justify it. If the principle of identity is in any way true, even if this is at the infinitesimal level of two atoms, then the entire conventional edifice of science which draws its inspiration from it is also true. The hypothesis of the genetic code DNA is also true and cannot be defeated. The same goes for metaphysics. Science explains things which have been defined and formalized in advance and which subsequently conform to these explanations, that's all that objectivity is. The ethics that come to sanction this objective knowledge are just systems of defense and misconstrual machinations that aim to preserve this vicious circle. 2. As Nietzsche said, down with all hypotheses that have allowed belief in a real world. The tactile and the digital 
Regulation on the model of the genetic code is in no way limited to effects in the laboratory or the exalted visions of theoreticians, these models invest life at its most banal level. Digitality is among us. It haunts all the Page 61 Page 62 Messages and signs of our society, and we can clearly locate its most concrete form in the test, the question slash answer, the stimulus slash response. All content is neutralized by a continuous process of orchestrated interrogations, verdicts and ultimatums to be decoded, which this time no longer come from the depths of the genetic code but still possess the same tactical indeterminacy the cycles of meaning become infinitely shorter in the cycles of the question slash answer the bit or the return of a minuscule quantity of energy slash information to its point of departure this cycle merely describes the perpetual reactualization of the same models the equivalent of the total neutralization of signifieds by the code is the instantaneous verdict of fashion or of every billboard or TV advertising message. Everywhere supply devours demand. The question devours the answer, either absorbing and regurgitating it in a decodable form, or inventing it and anticipating its predictable corroboration. Everywhere the same scenario of trials and errors, the burden of which, in laboratory tests, is borne by guinea pigs, the scenario of the spectrum of choices on offer or the multiple choice, test your personality. The test is everywhere the fundamental social form of control, which works by infinitely dividing. Practices and Responses We live in a referendum mode precisely because there is no longer any referential. Every sign and every message. Objects of functional utility just as much as fashion features or any televised information, polls, or discussions, is presented to us as a question slash answer. The entire communications system has passed from a complex syntactic structure of language to a binary system of question slash answer signals perpetual testing. Tests and referenda are, as we know, perfect forms of simulation, the question induces the answer, it is designated in advance. The referendum, then, is only an Ultimatum, the unilateral question is precisely not an interrogation anymore, but the immediate imposition of a meaning, which simultaneously completes the cycle. Every message is a verdict, delivered like the verdict of polling statistics. The simulacrum of distance, or indeed of contradiction, between the two poles is nothing but a tactical hallucination, like the reality effect on the interior of the sign itself. Benjamin provides this test function at the concrete level of the technical apparatus. The artistic performance of the screen actor is presented by a camera, with a twofold consequence. The camera that presents the performance of the film actor to the public need not respect the performance as an integral whole. Guided by the cameraman, the camera continually changes its position with respect to the performance. The sequence of positional views which the editor composes with the material supplied him constitutes the completed film. Hence, the performance of the actor is subjected to a series of optical tests. This is the first consequence of the fact that the actor's performance is presented by means of the camera. Also, the film actor lacks the opportunity of the stage actor to adjust to the audience during the performance, 
since he does not present his performance to the audience in person. This permits the audience to take the position of the critic, without experiencing any personal contact with the actor. The audience's identification with the actor is really an identification with the page 62 page 63 camera consequently the audience takes the position of the camera its approach is that of testing note the expansion of the field of the testable which mechanical equipment brings about for the actor corresponds to the extraordinary expansion of the field of the testable brought about for the individual through economic conditions thus vocational aptitude tests become constantly more important what matters in these tests are segmental performances of the individual the film shot and the vocational aptitude test are taken before a committee of experts the camera director in the studio occupies a place identical with that of the examiner during aptitude tests he work of art of the Dadaists became an instrument of ballistics it hit the spectator like a bullet it happened to him thus acquiring a tactile quality it promoted a demand for the film the distracting element of which is also primarily tactile being based on changes of place and focus which periodically assail the spectator the work of art pages 230 240 contemplation is impossible images fragment perception into successive sequences and stimuli to which the only Response is an instantaneous yes or no reaction time is maximally reduced. The film no longer allows you to contemplate. It, it interrogates you directly. According to McLuhan, it is in this sense that the modern media demand greater immediate participation, three incessant response and total plasticity, Benjamin compares the cameraman's operation to the surgeon's tactility and manipulation. Messages no longer have an informational role, they test and take polls, ultimately so as to control, contra role in the sense that all your responses are already inscribed in the role, on the anticipated register of the code. Editing montage and encoding in fact demand that the recipient dismantle demonte and decode in accordance with the same process. Every reading of a message is thus nothing more than a perpetual test of the code. Every image, every media message and also every surrounding functional object is a test. That is to say, in all the rigor of the term, it triggers response mechanisms in accordance with stereotypes or analytic models. The object today is no longer functional in the traditional sense of the term, it doesn't serve you, it tests you. It no longer has anything to do with yesterday's object, any more than mediatized information has with the reality of facts. Both object and information already result from a selection, an edited sequence of camera angles, they have already tested reality and have only asked those questions to which it has responded. Reality has been analyzed into simple elements which have been recomposed into scenarios of stable oppositions, just as the photographer imposes his own contrasts, lighting, and angles. Onto his subject, any photographer will tell you that no matter what you do it is enough to catch the original from a good angle at the moment or inflection that turns it into the exact response to the instantaneous test of the apparatus and its code, 
exactly like the test or referendum when they translate a given conflict or problem into a question slash answer game. Thus tested, reality tests you in return according to the same scorecard, and you decode it following the same code. Inscribed in its every message and object like a miniature genetic code. Page 63 Page 64 You already test the mere fact that everything is presented today according to a spectrum or range, since it imposes selectivity on you. This conforms to the global usage we have of the surrounding world of reading and selective decoding we live less as users than as readers and selectors, reading cells. But beware, since by the same token you are yourself constantly selected and tested by the medium itself. Just as we select a sample for purposes of a survey, the media frame and cut sample receivers by means of beamed messages which are in fact a network of selected questions. By a circular operation of experimental modifications and incessant interference, like nervous, tactile and retractal impulses, probing an object by means of short perceptual sequences until it has been localized and controlled, the media localiza and structure not real, autonomous groups, but samples, modeled socially and mentally by a barrage of Messages. Public opinion is evidently the finest of these samples not an unreal but a hyperreal political substance, the fantastic hyperreality which survives only by editing and manipulation by the test. The eruption of the binary question slash answer schema is of incalculable importance. Dislocating all discourse in a now bygone golden age. This schema short circuits every dialectic of the signifier and the signified, a representative and a represented. There are no longer any objects whose signifieds are their functions, with opinion that representative representatives would vote for, and the real interrogation to which the answer responds, and there are especially no longer any questions to which there are no answers. This entire process is dislocated, the contradictory processes of the true and the false, the real, and the imaginary are abolished in this hyper-real logic of the montage. Michel Tort provides a fine analysis of this in his book on the intelligence quotient. The question as such does not determine its response in the form in which it was posed, it is the meaning given to it by the person to whom it was posed and also the idea the interrogated subject forms of the most appropriate tactic to adopt in order to respond according to the idea he forms of the interrogation's expectations. L.E. Quotient Intellectual, Paris Maspero, 1974. Tort again. The artifact is something other than a controlled transformation of the object for purposes of knowledge, it is a savage intervention in reality, at the end of which it is impossible to distinguish what in this reality arises out of objective knowledge and what results from the technical intervention, the medium. The IQ is such an artifact. No more true and false since we can no longer find any gap between question and answer. In the light of these tests, intelligence, like opinion, and more generally every process of signification, is reduced to the capacity to produce. Contrasting reactions to an increasing range of appropriate stimuli. This whole analysis directly reflects McLuhan's formula the medium is. Page 64 Page 65 The message It is in fact the medium, the very mode of editing, cutting, questioning, 
enticement, and demand by the medium that rules the process of signification. So we can understand why McLuhan saw an era of tactile communication. In the era of electronic mass media, in this we are closer in effect to the tactile than we are to the visual universe, where there is greater distance, and reflection is always possible. At the moment that touching loses its sensory, sensual value. For us, touching is an interaction of the senses rather than a simple contact between a skin and an object, it is possible that it might once more become the schema of a universe of communication but this time as a field of tactile and tactical simulation where the message becomes a message, a tentacular enticement, a test. In every field we are tested, probed, and sampled, the method is tactical and the sphere of communication tactile. Not to mention the ideology of contact which in all of its forms, seeks to replace the idea of social relations. A whole strategic configuration revolves around a test, the question-slash-answer cell, as it does around a molecular command code. The entire political sphere loses its specificity as soon as it enters the media's polling game, that is to say, when it enters the integrated circuit of the question slash answer. The electoral sphere is in any case the first large-scale institution where social exchange is reduced to getting a response. Thanks to these simplified signals, the electoral sphere is also the first institution to be universalist, universal suffrage is the first of the mass media throughout the 19th and 20th centuries, political and economic practice merge increasingly into the same type of discourse, propaganda and publicity. Were fused, marketing and merchandising both objects and powerful ideas. This linguistic convergence between the economic and the political is moreover what marks a society such as ours, where political economy has been fully realized. By the same token, it is also its end, since the two spheres are abolished in another reality or media hyperreality. Here again, each term is elevated to a higher power, that of third order simulacra. While many regret the media's corruption of politics and deplore the fact that the TV switch and the public Opinion polls have cheerfully replaced opinion formation, this merely testifies that they have not understood politics at all. L. Emond This phase of political hyperrealism is characterized by the necessary conjunction of the two-party system and the emergence of opinion polls as the mirror of this alternating equivalence of the political game. Opinion polls are situated beyond all social production of opinion. They now refer only to a simulacrum of public opinion. This mirror of opinion is analogous in its way to that of the gross national product, the imaginary mirror of productive forces without regard for their social finality or counter-finality, the essential thing being merely that it's a is reproduced. The same goes for public opinion, where what matters most is that it grows incessantly in its own image. This is the secret of mass representation. Nobody need produce an opinion anymore, but everyone must. Page 65 Page 66 Reproduce public opinion, in the sense that all opinions are swallowed up in this kind of general equivalent and proceed from it thereafter, reproduce it, or what they take it to be, at the level of individual choice. For opinion as for material goods, production is dead, 
long live reproduction. If McLuhan's formula becomes significant anywhere, it is certainly here. For public opinion is par excellence both the medium and the message. The poles informing this opinion are the unceasing imposition of the medium as the message. They thereby belong to the same order as TV and the electronic media, which, as we have seen, are also a perpetual question slash answer game, an instrument of perpetual polling. Polls manipulate the undecidable. Do they affect votes? True or false? Do they yield exact photographs of reality, or of mere tendencies, or a refraction of this reality in a hyperspace of simulation whose curvature we do not even know? True or false? Undecidable. However sophisticated their analyses, they always leave room for the reversibility of hypotheses. Statistics is just casuistry. This undecidability is proper to every simulation process, see above for the undecidability of the crisis. The internal logic of these processes, statistics, probabilities, operational cybernetics, is certainly rigorous and scientific, yet it somehow doesn't get any purchase on anything, it is a fabulous fiction whose index of refraction in, true or false, reality is zero. This condition is all that gives these models any force, but the only truth it leaves them comes from paranoid projection tests of a cast or group, undecidability dreaming of a miraculous ad equation between the real and their own models, and therefore an absolute manipulation. What is true in the scenario of statistics is also true of the regulated partition of the political sphere, the alternation of the forces in power, minority-slash-majority substitutions and so on. At the limit of pure representation, it ca no longer represents anything. Politics dies from the overregulated play of its distinct oppositions. The political sphere, more generally, the sphere of power, is emptied. In some ways this is the ransom for the fulfillment of the desire of the political class for a perfect manipulation of social representation. Smoothly and surreptitiously, all social substance vanishes from this machine at the very moment of its perfected reproduction. The same goes for opinion polls, it is ultimately only members of the political classes who believe in them, just as it is. Only brokers and advertising executives who really believe in publicity and market analyses. This is not due to a particular stupidity, although we can't rule this out, but because the polls are homogeneous to the way contemporary politics operate. They therefore take on a real tactical value, operating as a regulating factor of the political classes in accordance with their own game rules. The political classes, then, have good reason to believe in polls, as in fact they do. Ultimately, though, who else does? It is the burlesque spectacle of the hyper-representative, that is, not representative at all, political sphere that people savor and sample through opinion polls and page 66 page 67 the media there is a jubilation proper to this spectacular nullity, and the final form that it takes is that of statistical contemplation. Such contemplation, moreover, is always coupled, as we know, with a profound disappointment the 
species of disillusion that the poles provoke by absorbing all public speaking, by short-circuiting every means of expression. They exert fascination in proportion to this neutralization through emptiness, to the vertigo they create by anticipating every possible reality in the image. The problem of opinion poles, then, is not their objective influence at all. As far as propaganda and advertising are concerned, such influence is, as we know, largely annulled by individual or collective resistance or inertia. Their problem is the operational simulation that they institute across the entire range of social practices, the leukemia infecting all social substance, replacing blood with the white lymph of the media. The question-slash-answer circularity runs through every domain. We are slowly beginning to notice that the whole domain of surveys, polls, and statistics must be revised according to the radical suspicion brought to bear on their methods. The same suspicion bears, however, on ethnology. Unless you admit that the natives are totally natural and incapable of simulation, then the problem is the same with the above as it is here, it is impossible to obtain a non-simulated response to a direct question, apart from merely reproducing the question. It is not even certain that we can test plants, animals or inert matter in the exact sciences with any hope of an objective response. As to how those polled respond to the pollsters, how natives respond to ethnologists, the analysts and to the analyst, you may be sure that there is total circularity. In every case, those questioned always behave as the questioner imagines they will and solicits them to. Even the psychoanalytic transference and counter-transference collapses today under the shock of this stimulated, simulated and anticipated response, which is simply a modality of the self-fulfilling prophecy. 5. So we come up against the strange paradox where whatever those polled, analysands and natives say, it is irremediably short-circuit and lost. Indeed, it is. On the basis of this foreclosure that these disciplines sociology, psychoanalysis, and ethnology will be able to develop in leaps and bounds. Such amazing development is just hot air, however, since the circular response of those polled, the analysands and the natives is nevertheless a challenge and a victorious revenge, when they turn the question back on itself, isolating it by holding the expected mirror image response up to it, then there is no hope that the question can ever get out of what is in fact the vicious circle of power. It is exactly the same in the electoral system, where representatives no longer represent anything, by dint of controlling the electoral body's responses so well, somewhere, everything has escaped them. That is why the controlled responses of the dominated are nevertheless somehow a genuine response, a desperate vengeance which lets power bury power. The systems of the advanced democracies become stable through the formula of the two-party system. The de facto monopoly remains in the page 67. Page 68. Hands of a homogeneous political class, from the left to the right, but must not be exercised in this way. This is because single party rule, totalitarianism, is an unstable form which drains the political stage and can no longer ensure the feedback of public opinion the minimal current in the integrated circuit that constitutes the transistorist political 
machine. The two-party system, by contrast, is the end of the end of representation since solicitation reaches its highest degree, in the name of a simple formal constraint, when you approach the greatest perfect competitive equation between the two parties. This is only logical, democracy attains the law of equivalence in the political order, and this law is fulfilled by the seesawing of the two terms, which thus maintains their equivalence but by means of this minuscule. Divergence allows for public consensus and the closure of the cycle of representation, a theater of operations where only the smoky reflections of political reason continue to function. Democracy's credo of the individual's free choice effectively turns into its exact opposite, voting has become absolutely obligatory. If this is not the case de jure, then it is. Through the structural, statistical constraint of the two-party system, reinforced by the opinion polls, six voting has become absolutely aleatory, when democracy reaches a formally advanced stage, it is distributed in equal quantities, 50 fiftieths. Voting merges with the Brownian motion of particles or probability calculus, as if the whole world were voting. According to chance, as if signs were voting. At this point, it matters little what the parties in power express historically and socially it is even necessary that they know longer represent anything, the fascination of the game and the polls, the formal and statistical compulsion, is so much greater. Classical universal suffrage already implies a certain neutralization of the political field, in the name of a consensus over the rules of the game. But we can still distinguish the representatives and the represented in this game, on the basis of a real social antagonism in opinions. The neutralization of this contradictory referential, under the sign of a public opinion, which from now on is equal to itself, mediatized and homogenized by means of anticipation, polls, will make possible an alternation, not of parties, but of their heads, creating a simulated opposition between the two parties, absorbing their respective objectives, and a reversibility of every discourse into any other. Beyond the representative and the represented, this is the pure form of representation, just as, beyond the signifier and the signified, simulation marks the pure form of the political economy of the sign, just as, beyond use value and exchange value, beyond every substance of production. The flotation of currencies and their accountable drift marks the pure form of value. It may seem that the historical movement of capital carries it from open competition towards oligopoly and then towards monopoly, that democracy moves from a multi-party system to a two-party system and then towards single-party rule. Oligopoly, or real duopoly, results from the tactical division of the monopoly. In every domain duopoly is the compage. Page 68 Page 69 Plotted stage of monopoly It is not that a political will, state intervention, antitrust laws, etc., shatters the markets. Monopoly, any unitary system, if it wants to survive, must find a binary regulation. This does not change anything as regards monopoly, on the contrary, power is only absolute if it is able to diffract into various equivalents, if it knows how to divide in order to become stronger. This goes for detergent brands as much as for a peaceful coexistence. 
2. Superpowers are necessary in order to keep the universe under control, a single empire would crumble by itself. The balance of terror merely allows regulated oppositions to be put in place, for strategy is structural, never atomic. Even if this regulated opposition can be ramified into a more complex scenario, the matrix remains binary. From now on, it will never again be a question of a dual or open competitive struggle, but one of couplets of simultaneous oppositions. From the smallest disjunctive unit, the question slash answer particle, up to the macroscopic level of the great two party. Systems that govern the economy, politics, and global coexistence, the matrix never changes. It is always the zero slash one, the binary scanzion that is affirmed as the metastable or homeostatic form of contemporary systems. It is the core of the processes of simulation that dominate us. It can be organized into a game of unstable variations, from polyvalence to tautology, without putting the strategic form of the duopola into question. It is the divine form of simulation. 7. Why has the World Trade Center in New York got two towers? All Manhattan's great buildings are always content to confront each other in a competitive verticality, from which there results an architectural panorama that is the image of the capitalist system, a pyramidal jungle, every building on the offensive against every other. The system itself can be spotted in the famous image we have of New York on arriving by sea. This image has changed completely in a few years. The effigy of the capitalist system has passed from the pyramid to the punch card. The buildings are no longer obelisks, but trustingly stand next to one another like the columns of a statistical graph. This new architecture no longer embodies a competitive system, but a countable one where competition has disappeared in favor of correlation. New York is the only city in the world to have retraced, throughout the entire length and breadth of its history, the contemporary form of the capitalist system in this way, instantaneously changing according to the system. No European city has ever done this. This architectural graphism belongs to the monopoly, the World Trade Center's two towers are perfect parallelopipeds, 400 meters high on a square base, they are perfectly balanced and blind communicating vessels. The fact that there are two identical towers signifies the end of all competition, the end of every original reference. Paradoxically, if there were only one, the WTC would not embody the monopoly, since we have seen that it becomes stable in a dual form. For the sign to remain pure it must become its own double, this doubling of the sign really put an end to what it designated. Every Andy Warhol does this, the multiple replicas of Marilyn Monroe's face are of course at the same time the death of the page 69 page 70 original and the end of representation the two towers of the WTC are the visible sign of the closure of a system in the vertigo of doubling while the other skyscrapers are each the original moment of a system continually surpassing itself in the crisis and the challenge. This doubling, this replication, inspires a particular fascination. However high they are and however much higher than all the others, 
the two towers nevertheless signify an arrested verticality. They ignore the other buildings, they are not of the same race, they no longer challenge them nor compare themselves to them, the two towers reflect one another and reach their highest point in the prestige of similitude. They echo the idea of the model they are for one another, and they're semi-detached. Altitude no longer has a transcendent value, but only signifies that the commutative strategy of the model will now historically prevail over the heart of the system itself, as New York truly is, over the traditional strategy of competition. The buildings of the Rockefeller Center also mirror their glass and steel facades in one another, in the cities. Infinite specularity. The towers are themselves blind and no longer have a facade. Every reference to habitat, to the facade as face, to the interior and exterior, that we still find even in the Chase Manhattan Bank or in the most daring mirror buildings from the 60s has been erased. At the same moment that the rhetoric of verticality is disappearing, so too is the rhetoric of the mirror. There now remains only a series based on the binary code, as if architecture, in the image of the system, proceeded only by means of an unchanging genetic code, a definitive model. The hyperrealism of simulation. We have just defined a digital space, a magnetic field of the code with its modeled polarizations, diffractions and gravitations, with the insistent and perpetual flux of the smallest disjunctive units, the question slash answer cell operates like the cybernetic atom of signification. We must now measure the disparity between this field of control and the traditional field of repression, the police space which used to correspond to a violence of signification. This space was one of reactionary conditioning, inspired by the Pavlovian apparatus of programmed and repetitive aggression which we also saw scaled up in hard sell advertising and the political propaganda of the 30s. A crafted but industrial violence that aimed to produce terrified behavior and animal obedience. This no longer has any meaning. Totalitarian, bureaucratic concentration is a schema dating from the era of the market law of value. The schema of equivalences effectively imposes the form of a general equivalent, and hence the centralization of a global process. This is an archaic rationality. Compared to simulation, in which it is no longer a single general equivalent but a diffraction of models that plays the regulative role, no longer the form of the general equivalent, but the form of distinct oppositions. We pass from injunction to disjunction. Page 70 Page 71 Through the code, from the ultimatum to solicitation, from obligatory passivity to models constructed from the outset on the basis of the subject's active response, and this subject's involvement and ludic participation, towards a total environment model made up of incessant spontaneous responses, joyous feedback, and irradiated contacts. According to Nicholas Scoffer, this is a concretization of the general ambience, the great festival of participation is made up of myriad stimuli, miniaturist tests, and infinitely divisible questions slash answers, all magnetized by several great models in the luminous field of the code. Here comes the great culture of tactile communication, under the sign of techno-luminokinetic space and total spatiodynamic theater. 
a whole imaginary based on contact, a sensory mimicry and a tactile mysticism, basically ecology in its entirety, comes to be grafted onto this universe of operational simulation, multi-stimulation, and multi-response. This incessant test of successful adaptation is naturalist by assimilating it to animal mimicry, the phenomenon of animals' adaptation to the colors and forms of their habitat also holds for man Nicholas Scoffer, and even to the Indians with their innate sense of ecology. Troisms, mimicry, and empathy, the ecological evangelism of open systems, with positive or negative feedback, will be engulfed in this breach, with an ideology of regulation through information that is only the avatar, in accordance with a more flexible rationality, of the Pavlov reflex. Hence electroshock is replaced by body attitude as the condition of mental health. When notions of need, perception, desire, etc., become operational, then the apparatuses of force and forcing yield to ambient apparatuses. A generalist, mystical ecology of the niche and the context, a simulated Environment eventually including the Centers for Cultural and Aesthetic Reanimation planned for the Left Bank, why not, and the Center for Sexual Leisure, which, built in the form of a breast, will offer a superlative euphoria thanks to a pulsating ambience. Workers from all classes will be able to enter these stimulating centers. A spatiodynamic Fascination, just like total theater, set up according to a hyperbolic, circular apparatus turning around a cylindrical spindle. No more scenes, no more cuts, no more gaze, the end of the spectacle and the spectacular, towards the total. Fusional, tactile, and aesthetic, and no longer the aesthetic, etc., environment. We can only think of Artaud's total theater. His theater of cruelty, of which this spatiodynamic simulation is the abject, black humor caricature. Here, cruelty is replaced by minimum and maximum stimulus thresholds, by the invention of perceptual codes calculated on the basis of saturation thresholds. Even the good old catharsis of the classical theater of the passions has today become a homeopathy by means of simulation. The end of the spectacle brings with it the collapse of reality into hyperrealism, the meticulous reduplication of the real, preferably through another reproductive medium such as advertising or photography. Through reproduction from one medium into another the real becomes volatile, it becomes the allegory of death, but it also draws strength from its. Page 71 Page 72 Own destruction, becoming the real for its own sake, a fetishism of the lost object which is no longer the object of representation, but the ecstasy of denegation and its own ritual extermination, the hyperreal. Realism had already inaugurated this tendency. The rhetoric of the real already signals that its status has been radically altered, the golden age of the innocence of language where what is said need not be doubled in an effect of reality. Surrealism was still in solidarity with the realism it contested, but which it doubled and ruptured in the imaginary. The hyperreal represents a much more advanced phase insofar as it effaces the contradiction of the real and the imaginary. A reality no longer belongs to the dream or the phantasm, to a beyond or a hidden interiority, but to the hallucinatory 
resemblance of the real to itself. To gain exit from the crisis of representation, the real must be sealed off in a pure repetition. Before emerging in pop art and painterly neorealism, this tendency can already be discerned in the nouveau. Roman. Here the project is to construct a void around the real, to eradicate all psychology and subjectivity from it in order to give it a pure objectivity. In fact, this is only the objectivity of the pure gaze, an objectivity finally free of the object, but which merely remains a blind relay of the gaze that scans it. It is easy to detect the unconscious trying to remain hidden in this circular seduction. This is indeed the impression made by the Nouveau Roman, a wild elision of meaning in a meticulous but blind reality. Syntax and semantics have disappeared, the object now only appears in court, where its scattered fragments are subjected to unremitting cross-examination. There is neither metaphor nor metonymy, only a successive imminence under the law, enforcing authority of the gaze. This objective microscopy incites reality to vertiginous motion, the vertiginous death of representation within the confines of representation. The old illusions of relief, perspective, and depth, both spatial and psychological, bound up with the perception of the object are over with, optics in its entirety, scopics, has begun to operate on the surface of things the gaze has become the object's molecular code. There are several possible modalities of this vertigo of realistic simulation. One the detailed deconstruction of the real, the paradigmatic close reading of the object, the flattening out, linearity and seriality of part objects. Two abyssal vision, all the games of splitting the object in two and duplicating it in every detail. This reduction is taken to be a depth, indeed a critical meta-language, and doubtless this was true of a reflective configuration of the sign in a dialectics of the mirror. From now on this infinite refraction is nothing more than another type of seriality in which the real is no longer reflected, but folds in on itself to the point of exhaustion. 3. The properly serial form, Andy Warhol here the paradigmatic dimension is abolished along with the syntagmatic dimension, since there is no longer a flexion of forms, nor even an internal reflection, only a page 72, page 73, contiguity of the same, zero degree flexion and reflection. Take this erotic photograph of twin sisters where the fleshy reality of their bodies is annihilated by their similarity. How do you invest when the beauty of the one is immediately duplicated in the other? The gaze can only go from one to the other, and these poles enclose all vision. This is a subtle means of murdering the original, but it is also a singular seduction, where the total extent of the object is intercepted by its infinite diffraction into itself, this scenario reverses the platonic myth of the reunion of two halves separated by a symbol. In the series, signs subdivide like protozoa. Perhaps this is the seduction of death, in the sense that, for we sexually differentiated beings, death is perhaps not nothingness, but quite simply the mode of reproduction prior to sexual differentiation. The models that generate in infinite chains effectively bring us closer to the generation of protozoa, sex, which for us is confused with life, being the only remaining difference. 
For this pure machinality is doubtless only a paradoxical limit, however. Binarity and digitality constitute the true generative formula which encompasses all the others and is, in a way, the stabilized form of the code. This does not mean pure repetition, but minimal difference, the minimal inflection between two terms, that is, the smallest common paradigm that can sustain the fiction of meaning. A cominatory of differentiation internal to the painterly object as well. As to the consumer object, this simulation contracts, in contemporary art, to the point of being nothing more than the infinitesimal difference that still separates hyperreality from hyperpainting. Hyperpainting claims to exhaust itself to the point of its sacrificial eclipse in the face of the real, but we know how all painting's prestige is revived in this infinitesimal difference, painting retreats into the border that separates the painted surface and the wall. It also hides in the signature, the metaphysical sign of painting and the metaphysics of representation at the limit, where it takes itself as its own model, the pure gaze, and turns around itself in the compulsive repetition of the code. The very definition of the real is that of which it is possible to provide an equivalent reproduction. It is a contemporary of science, which postulates that a process can be reproduced exactly within given conditions, with an industrial rationality which postulates a universal system of equivalences, classical representation is not equivalence but transcription. Interpretation and Commentary At the end of this process of reproducibility, the real is not only that which can be reproduced, but that which is always already reproduced, the hyperreal. So are we then at the end of the real and the end of art due to a total mutual reabsorption? No, since at the level of simulacra, hyperrealism is the apex of both art and the real, by means of a mutual exchange of the privileges and prejudices that found them. The hyperreal is beyond representation, cf. Jean-François Lyotard, Esquisse d'une économique de l'hyperrealisme, l'art vivant, 36, 1973, 8 only because it is entirely within simulation, in which the barriers of representation rotate crazily, an implosive madness which, far from being eccentric, keeps its gaze fixed on. Page 73 Page 74 The center, on its own abyssal repetition. Analogous to the effect of an internal distance from the dream, allowing us to say that we are dreaming, hyperrealism is only the play of censorship and the perpetuation of the dream, becoming an integral part of a coded reality that it perpetuates and leaves unaltered. In fact, Hyperrealism must be interpreted in inverse manner, today reality itself is hyperrealist. The secret of surrealism was that the most everyday reality could become surreal, but only at privileged instants which again arose out of art and the imaginary. Today everyday, political, social, historical, economic, etc., Reality has already incorporated the hyperrealist dimension of simulation so that we are now living entirely within the aesthetic hallucination of reality. The old slogan reality is stranger than fiction, which still corresponded to the surrealist stage in the aestheticization of life, has been outrun since there is no longer any fiction that life can possibly confront, even as its conqueror. Reality has 
passed completely into the game of reality. Radical disaffection, the cool and cybernetic stage, replaces the hot. Phantasmatic phase. The consummate enjoyment jaurisance of the signs of guilt, despair, violence, and death are replacing guilt, anxiety and even death in the total euphoria of simulation. This euphoria aims to abolish cause and effect, origin, and end, and replace them with reduplication. Every closed system protects itself in this way from the referential and the anxiety of the referential, as well as from all meta-language that the system wards off by operating its own meta-language, that is, by duplicating itself as its own critique. In simulation, the metalinguistic illusion reduplicates and completes the referential illusion, the pathetic hallucination of the sign and the pathetic hallucination of the real. It's a circus, it's a theater, it's a movie, all these old adages are ancient naturalist denunciations. This is no longer what is at issue. What is at issue this time is turning the real into a satellite, putting an undefinable reality with no common measure into orbit with the phantasma that once illustrated it. This satellization has subsequently been materialized as the two-room kitchen shower which we really have sent into orbit, to the spatial power you could say, with the latest lunar module. The most everyday aspect of the terrestrial environment raised to the rank of a cosmic value, an absolute decor. Hypostatist in space. This is the end of metaphysics and the beginning of the era of hyperreality. 9. The spatial transcendence of the banality of the two-room apartment by a cool, machinic figuration in hyperrealism 10 tells us only one thing, however, this module, such as it is, participates in a hyperspace of representation where everyone is already in possession of the technical means for the instant reproduction of his or her own life. Thus the Tupolev's pilots who crashed in Bauerget were able, by means of their cameras, to see themselves dying at first hand. This is nothing other than the short circuit of the response by the question in the test, a process of instant renewal whereby reality is immediately contaminated by its simulacrum. Page 74 Page 75 A specific class of allegorical and somewhat diabolical objects used to exist, made up of mirrors, images, works of art. Concepts. Although simulacra, they were transparent and manifest, you could distinguish craftsmanship facon from the counterfeit contrafacon, with their own characteristic style and savoir faire. Pleasure, then, consisted in locating what was natural within what was artificial and counterfeit. Today, where the real and the imaginary are intermixed in one and the same operational totality, aesthetic fascination reigns supreme, with subliminal perception, a sort of sixth sense, of special effects, editing and script, reality is overexposed to the glare of models. This is no longer a space of production, but a reading strip, a coding and decoding strip, magnetized by signs. Aesthetic reality is no longer achieved through art's premeditation and distancing, but by its elevation to the second degree, to the power of two, by the anticipation and imminence of the code. A kind of unintentional parody hovers over everything, a tactical simulation, a Consummate aesthetic enjoyment jaurisance, 
is attached to the indefinable play of reading and the rules of the game. Traveling signs, media, fashion, and models, the blind but brilliant ambience of simulacra. Art has for a long time prefigured this turn, by veering towards what today is a turn to everyday life. Very early on the work of art produced a double of itself as the manipulation of the signs of art, bringing about an over-signification of art. Or, as Levi Strauss said, an academicization of the signifier, irreversibly introducing art to the form of the sign. At this point art entered into infinite reproduction, with everything that doubles itself, even the banal reality of the everyday. Falling by the same token under the sign of art and becoming aesthetic. The same goes for production, which we might say has today entered into aesthetic reduplication, the phase where, expelling all content and all finality, it becomes somehow abstract and non-figurative. In this way it expresses the pure form of production, taking upon itself, as art does, the value of the finality without end. Art and industry may then exchange their signs, art can become a reproductive machine, Andy Warhol, without ceasing to be art, since the machine is now nothing but a sign. Production can also lose all its social finality as its means of verification, and finally glorify in the prestigious, hyperbolic, and aesthetic signs that the great industrial complexes are 400 m high towers or the numerical mysteries of the gross national product. So art is everywhere, since artifice lies at the heart of reality. So art is dead, since not only is its critical transcendence dead, but reality itself, entirely impregnated by an aesthetic that holds onto its very structurality, has become inseparable from its own image. It no longer even has the time to take on the effect of reality. Reality is no longer stranger than fiction, it captures every dream before it can take on the dream effect. A schizophrenic vertigo of serial signs that have no counterfeit, no possible sublimation, and are imminent to their own repetition who will say where the reality they simulate now lies. They no longer even repress anything, which, if you like, keeps simulation from entering the sphere of psychosis even the page 75 page 76 primary processes have been annihilated the cool universe of digitality absorbs the universe of metaphor and metonymy the simulation principle dominates the reality principle as well as the pleasure principle cool killer or the insurrection of signs in the spring of 1972 in New York a spate of graffiti broke out which, starting with ghetto walls and fences, finally overcame subways and buses, lorries and elevators, corridors and monuments, completely ing them in graphics. Ranging from the rudimentary to the sophisticated, whose content was neither political nor pornographic. These graphics consisted solely of names, surnames drawn from underground comics such as Duke Spirit Super Cool, Cool Killer Ace Viper Spider Eddie Cola and so on, followed by their street number Eddie 135, Woody 110 Shadow 137, etc. or even by a number in Roman numerals, a dynastic or filiatory index snake eye. Snake 2, Snake 3, etc. up to L, 50, depending on which name, which totemic designation is taken up by these new 
graphitists. This was all done with magic markers or spray paint, allowing the inscriptions to be a meter or more in height by the entire length of the subway car. At night, youths would work their way into bus depots or subways, even getting inside the cars, breaking out into an orgy of graphics. The following day all these subway trains cross Manhattan in both directions. The graphics are erased, but this is difficult, the graffitists are arrested and imprisoned, the sale of marker. Pens and spray cans is forbidden, but to no avail, since the youths manufacture them by hand and start again every night. Today this movement has stopped, or at least is no longer so extraordinarily violent. It could only have been ephemeral. And, besides, in a single year of history it developed greatly. The graffitists became more expert, with incredible Baroque graphics, and ramified into styles and schools connected to the different groups in operation. Young Blacks and Porto Rickens originated the movement, and the graffitists were particular to New York. Several wall paintings are found in other cities with large ethnic minorities, improvised collective works with an ethno-political content, but very little. Graffiti One thing is certain, both the graffitists and the muralists sprang up after the repressions of the great urban riots of 196,670 like the riots, graffiti was a savage offensive, but of another kind, changing content and terrain. A new type of intervention in the city, no longer as a site of economic and political power, but as a space-time of the terrorist power of the media, signs, and the dominant culture. The urban city is also a neutralized, homogeneous space, a space where indifference, the segregation of urban ghettos, and the downgrading of districts, races, and certain age groups are on the increase. In short, it is the page 76, page 77, cut up space of distinctive signs. Multiple codes assign a determinate space-time to every act and instant of every day. Life The racial ghettos on the outskirts or in the city center are only the limit expression of this urban configuration, an immense center for marshalling and enclosure where the system reproduces itself not only economically and spatially but also in depth by the ramifications of signs and codes, by the symbolic destruction of social relations. There is a horizontal and vertical expansion of the city in the image of the economic system itself. Political economy, however, has a third dimension where all sociality is invested, covered, and dismantled by signs. Neither architecture nor Urbanism can do anything about this, since they themselves result from this new turn taken by the general economy of the system, they are its operational semiology. The city was first and foremost a site for the production and realization of commodities, a site of industrial concentration and exploitation. Today the city is first and foremost the site of the sign's execution, as in its life or death sentence. In the city's red belt of factories, and in the working class outskirts, this is no longer the case for us. In this city, in the same space, the historical dimension of the class struggle, the negativity of labor power, were still inscribed, irreducible social specificity. The factory, as the model of socialization through capital, has not disappeared today but, in 
line with the general strategy, has been replaced by the entire city as the space of the code. The urban matrix no longer realizes a power, labor power, but a difference, the operation of the sign metallurgy has become semi-urgy. We see this urban scenario materialist in the new cities which directly result from the operational analysis of needs and sign functions, and in which everything is conceived, projected, and realized on the basis of an analytic definition. Environment, transport, labor, leisure, play and culture become so many commutable terms on the chessboard of the city, a homogeneous space defined as a total environment. Hence the connection between the urban landscape and racism, there is no difference between the act of packing people into one homogeneous space, which we call a ghetto, on the basis of a racial definition, and the act of making people homogeneous in a new city on the basis of a functional definition of their needs. It follows one and the same logic. The city is no longer the politico-industrial zone that it was in the 19th century, it is the zone of signs, the media, and the code. By the same token, its truth no longer lies in its geographical situation, as it did for the factory or even the traditional ghetto. Its truth, enclosure in the sign form, lies all around us. It is the ghetto of television and advertising, the ghetto of consumers and the consumed, of readers read in advance, encoded decoders of every message, those circulating in, and circulated by, the subway, leisure time entertainers and the entertained, etc. Every space-time of urban life is a ghetto, each of which is connected to every other. Today a multiplicity of codes submit socialization, or rather. Page 77 Page 78 Desocialization, to this structural breakdown. The era of production, commodities, and labor power merely amounts to the interdependence of all social processes, including exploitation, and it was on this socialization, realized in part by capital itself, that Marx based his revolutionary perspective. But this historical solidarity, whether factory, local, or class, Solidarity, has disappeared. From now on they are separate and indifferent under the sign of television and the automobile, under the sign of behavior models inscribed everywhere in the media or in the layout of the city. Everyone falls into line in their delirious identification with leading models, orchestrated models of simulation. Everyone is commutable, like the models themselves. This is the era of geometrically variable individuals. As for the geometry of the code, it remains fixed and centralized. The monopoly of this code, circulating throughout the urban fabric, is the genuine form of social relations. It is possible to conceive of the decentralization of the sphere of material production, even that the historical relation between the city and commodity production is coming to an end. The system can do without the industrial, productive city, the space-time of the commodity and market-based social relations. The signs of this development are evident. It cannot, however, do without the urban as the space-time of the code and reproduction, for the centrality of the code is the definition of power itself. Whatever attacks contemporary semiocracy, this new form of value, 
is therefore politically essential, graffiti for example. According to this new form there is a total commutability of elements within a functional set, each taking on meaning. Only insofar as it is a term that is capable of structural variation in accordance with the code. Under these conditions, radical revolt effectively consists in saying I exist, I am so and so, I live on such and such street. I am alive here and now. This would still be an identitarian revolt however, combating anonymity by demanding a proper name and a reality. The graffitists went further in that they opposed pseudonyms rather than names to anonymity. They are seeking not to escape the cominatory in order to regain an identity, which is impossible in any case, but to turn indeterminacy against the system, to turn indeterminacy into extermination. Retaliation, reversion of the code. According to its own logic, on its own terrain, gaining victory over it because it exceeds semiocracy's own non-referentiality. Superb SPIX Cola 139 Cool Guy Crazy Cross 136 means nothing, it is not even a proper name, but a symbolic matriculation number whose function it is to derail the common system of designations. Such terms are not at all original, they all come from comic strips where they were imprisoned in fiction. They blasted their way out however, so as to burst into reality like a scream, an interjection, an anti-discourse, as the waste of all syntactic, poetic, and political development, as the smallest radical element that cannot be caught by any organized discourse. Invincible due to their own poverty, they resist every interpretation and every connotation, no longer denoting anyone or anything. In this way. Page 78. Page 79. With neither connotation nor denotation, they escape the principle of signification and, as empty signifiers, erupt into the sphere of the full signs of the city, dissolving it on contact. Names without intimacy, just as the ghettos have no intimacy, no private life, but thrive on an intense collective exchange. These names make no claim to an identity or a personality, but claim the radical exclusivity of the clan, gang, age group, group, or ethnicity which, as we know, passes through the devolution of the name, coupled with an absolute loyalty, to this totemic designation, even if it came directly from the page S of underground comics. This form of symbolic designation is annihilated by our social structure which imposes a proper name and a private individuality on everyone, shattering all solidarity in the name of an urban, abstract, and universal sociality. These names or tribal appellations have, by contrast, a real symbolic charge, they are made to be given, exchanged, transmitted, and relate in a collective anonymity, where these names are exchanged as terms to introduce group members amongst each other. Although they are no more private a property than language, this is the real force of a symbolic ritual, and, in this sense, graffiti runs contrary to all media and advertising signs. Although they might create the illusion, on our city walls, that they are the same incantation. Advertising has been spoken of as a festival, since, without it, the urban environment would be dismal. But in fact it is only a cold bustle, a simulacrum of appeal and warmth, it makes no contacts, 
it cannot be revived by an autonomous or collective reading, and it does not create a symbolic network. More so than the walls that support it, advertising is itself a wall of functional signs made to be decoded, and its effects are exhausted in this decoding. All media signs issue from this space without qualities, from this surface of inscription set up between producers and consumers, transmitters, and receivers of signs. The city is a body without organs, as Delos says, 11 an intersection of channeled flows. The graffitists themselves come from the territorial order. They territorialize decoded urban spaces a particular street, wall, or district comes to life through them, becoming a collective territory again. They do not confine themselves to the ghetto, they export the ghetto through all the arteries of the city, they invade the white city and reveal that it is the real ghetto of the western world. A linguistic ghetto erupts into the city with graffiti, a kind of riot of signs. In the becoming sign of the sign, graffiti has until now always constituted the basest form, the sexual and pornographic base, the shameful, repressed inscriptions in peacewars and waste grounds. Only political and propagandistic slogans have conquered the walls in a direct offensive, full signs for which the wall is still a support and language a traditional medium. They are not aiming at the wall itself, nor at the pure functionality of signs as such. Doubtless it was only in May 68 in France that the graffiti and posters swept through the city in a different manner, attacking the support itself, producing a savage mobility on the walls, an inscription so sudden that it amounted to annihilating them. The inscriptions and Page 79 Page 80 Frescos et non tier actually hijacked the wall as a signifier of terrorist, functional grid space, an anti-media action. The proof is that the government has been careful enough neither to efface nor to repaint the walls, the mass political. Slogans and posters have taken responsibility for this. There is no need for repression since the media themselves, the far left media, have given the walls back their blind function. Since then, we have met with the Stockholm protest wall, where one is at liberty to protest on a certain surface, but where it is forbidden to put graffiti on neighboring surfaces. There has also been the ephemeral onslaught of the advertising hijack, limited by its own support, but already utilizing the avenues the media have themselves opened up, subways, stations, and posters. Consider also the assault on television by Jerry Rubin and America's counterculture. This is a political attempt to hijack a great mass medium, but only at the level of content and without changing the media themselves. New York Graffiti utilized urban clearways and mobile supports for the first time in a free and wide-ranging offensive. Above all, however, the very form of the media themselves, that is, their mode of production and distribution, was attacked for the first time. This was precisely because graffiti has no content and no message, this emptiness gives it its strength. So it was no accident that the total offensive was accompanied by a recession in terms of content. This comes from a sort of revolutionary intuition, namely that deep ideology no longer functions at the level of political signifieds. But at the level of the signifier, 
and that this is where the system is vulnerable and must be dismantled. Thus the political significance of graffiti becomes clear. It grew out of the repression of the urban riots in the ghettos. Struck by this repression, the revolt underwent a split into a doctrinal per et der Marxist-Leninist political organization. On the one hand, and, on the other, a savage cultural process with neither goal, ideology, nor content, at the level of signs. The first group called for a genuinely revolutionary practice and accused the graffitists of folklore, but it's the other way. Round, the defeat of 1970 brought about a regression into traditional political activism, but it also necessitated the radicalization of revolt on the real strategic terrain of the total manipulation of codes and significations. This is not at all a flight into signs, but on the contrary an extraordinary development in theory and practice, these two terms now know longer being kept distinct by the party. Insurrection and eruption in the urban landscape as the site of the reproduction of the code. At this level, relations of forces no longer count, since signs don't operate on the basis of force, but on the basis of difference. We must therefore attack by means of difference, dismantling the network of codes, attacking coded differences by means of an uncodable absolute difference, over which the system will stumble and disintegrate. There is no need for organized masses, nor for a political consciousness to do this a thousand youths armed with marker pens and cans of spray paint are enough to scramble the signals of Urbania and page 80 page 81 dismantle the order of signs graffiti covers every subway map in New York just as the checks changed the names of the streets in Prague to disconcert the Russians guerrilla action. Despite appearances, the city walls project, the painted walls, have nothing to do with graffiti. Moreover, they are prior to graffiti and will survive it. The initiative for these painted walls comes from the top as an innovatory attempt to enliven Urbania set up with municipal subsidies. The City Walls Incorporated organization was founded in 1969 to promote the program and technical aspects of wall painting. Its budget was covered by the New York Department of Cultural Affairs along with various other foundations such as that of David Rockefeller. His artistic ideology, the natural alliance between buildings and monumental painting. His goal, to make a gift of art to the people of New York. Consider also the Billboard Art Project in Los Angeles. This project was set up to promote artistic representations that use the billboard as a medium in the urban environment. Thanks to the collaboration of Foster and Kleiser two large advertising agencies, public bill posting spaces have thus become an art showcase for the painters of Los Angeles. They create a dynamic medium and take art out of the restricted circle of the galleries and museums. Of course, these operations are confined to professionals, Artists brought together in a consortium from New York. No. Possible ambiguity here, this is a question of a politics of the environment, of large-scale urban planning, where both the city and art gain. They gain because the city does not explode with the eruption of art out in the open, in the streets, nor does art explode on contact with the city? The entire city becomes an art gallery, art finds a whole new parading ground in the city. 
neither undergoes any structural alteration, they merely exchange their privileges. To make a gift of art to the people of New York. We need only compare this to Supercool's formula, there are those who don't like it, man, but whether they like it or not, we've become the strongest art movement to hit the city of New York. This makes all the difference. Some of the painted walls may be beautiful, but that has nothing to do with it. They will find a place in the history of art for having been able to create space on the blind, bare walls, by means of line and color. Alone, the trompelleries are always the most beautiful, those painted walls that create an illusion of space and depth. Those that enhance architecture with imagination, according to one of the artist's formulas. But this is precisely where their limits lie. They play at architecture without breaking the rules of the game, they recycle architecture in the imaginary, but retain the sacrament of architecture, from the technical support to the monumental structure, including even its social class aspect, since most of the city walls of this kind are in the white, civilized areas of the cities. So architecture and town planning, even if they are transfigured by the imagination, cannot change anything, since they are mass media themselves and, even in their most daring conception, they reproduce mass. Page 81 Page 82 Social relations, which is to say that collectively they allow people no response. All they can do is enliven, and participate. In urban recycling, design in the largest sense, the simulation of exchange and collective values, the simulation of play, and non-functional spaces. Hence the adventure parks for the children, the green spaces, the houses of culture, hence the city walls and the protest walls, the green spaces of language parole. The graffitists themselves care little for architecture, they defile it, forget about it and cross the street. The mural artist respects the wall as he used to respect the limitations of his easel. Graffiti runs from one house to the next, from one wall of a building to the next, from the wall onto the window or the door, or windows on subway trains, or the pavements. Graffiti overlaps, is thrown up, superimposes, superimposition amounting to the abolition of the support as a framework. Just as it is abolished as frame when its limits are not respected, its graphics resemble the child's polymorphous perversity, ignoring the boundaries between the sexes and the delimitation of erogenous zones. Curiously, moreover, graffiti turns the city's walls and corners, the subways, cars and the buses, into a body, a body without beginning or end. Made erotogenic in its entirety by writing just as the body may be in the primitive inscription, tattooing. Tattooing takes place on the body. In primitive societies, along with other ritual signs, it makes the body what it is material for symbolic exchange, without tattooing, as without masks, the body is only what it is, naked and expressionless. By tattooing walls. Super sex and super cool free them from architecture and turn them once again into living, social matter, into the moving body of the city before it has been branded with functions and institutions. The end of the four walls when they are tattooed like archaic effigies. End of the repressive space-time of urban transport systems where the subway cars fly. 
past like missiles or living hydras tattooed up to the eyes. Something about the city has become tribal, parietal, before. Writing, with these powerful emblems stripped of meaning. An incision into the flesh of empty signs that do not signify. Personal identity, but group initiation and affiliation, a bio-cybernetic self-fulfilling prophecy world or GI.12. It is nevertheless astonishing to see this unfold in a quaternary cybernetic city dominated by the two glass and aluminium. Towers of the World Trade Center, invulnerable metasigns of the system's omnipotence. There are also frescoes and murals in the ghettos, the spontaneous artworks of ethnic groups who paint their own walls. Socially and politically, the impulse is the same as with graffiti. These are savage painted walls, not financed by the urban administration. Moreover, they all focus on political themes, on a revolutionary message, the unity of the oppressed, world peace, the cultural promotion of ethnic communities, solidarity, and only rarely the violence of open struggle. In short, as opposed to graffiti, they have a meaning, a message. And, contrary to the City Walls project, which drew its inspiration from abstract, geometrical or page 82 page 83 surrealist art they are always inspired by figurative and idealist forms we can also see the difference between a scholarly and cultivated avant-garde art and the popular realist forms with a strong ideological content but formally less advanced even though they have a variety of inspirations, from children's drawings to Mexican frescoes, from a scholarly art to Douanier Rousseau, or from Fernand Ledger up to the simple images of Epinal, the sentimental illustrations of popular struggles. In any case, it is a matter of a counterculture that, far from being underground, is reflexive and connected to the political and cultural consciousness of the oppressed group. Here again, some of these walls are beautiful, others less so. That this aesthetic criterion can operate is in a certain way a sign of weakness. What I mean is that even though they are savages and anonymous collectives, they respect their support as well as the language of painting, even if this is in order to articulate a political act. In this sense, they can very easily be looked on as decorative works of art, some of them are even conceived as such, and have an eye turned towards their own value. Most of them are protected from this museum culturalization by the rapid destruction of the Fences and the crumbling walls here the municipal authorities do not put Ronis through art, and the negritude of the support is in the image of the ghetto. However, their mortality is not the same as the mortality of graffiti, which is systematically condemned to police repression, it is even forbidden to take photographs of it. This is because graffiti is more offensive and more radical, bursting into the white city, above all it is trans-ideological, trans-artistic. This is almost a paradox, whereas the black and Puerto Rican walls, even if they have not been signed, always carry a virtual signature, a political or cultural, if not an artistic, reference, graffiti, composed of nothing but names, effectively avoids every reference and every origin. It alone is savage, in that its message is zero. We will come to what it signifies elsewhere, 
by analyzing the two types of recuperation of which it is the object, apart from police repression. 1. It is recuperated as art. J. Jacobs, a primitive, mill-nile, communitarian form, not an elitist one like abstract expressionism. Or again, the subway cars rumble past one after the other throughout the station, like so many Jackson. Pollock's hurtling by, roaring through the corridors of the history of art. We speak of graffiti artists and an eruption of popular art created by youth, which will remain one of the important and characteristic manifestations of the art of the 70s, and so on. Always the aesthetic reduction, the very form of our dominant culture. To it is interpreted, and I am talking about the most admiring interpretations here, in terms of a reclamation of identity and personal freedom, as nonconformism, the indestructible survival of the individual in an inhuman environment. Mitzi Cunliffe in the New York Times A bourgeois humanist interpretation that comes from our feelings of frustration. In the anonymity of large cities. Cunliffe again, it says the graffiti says, I am, I am real, I have lived here. It says. Kiki, or Duke, or. Page 83. Page 84. Mike, or Gino is alive, he's doing well and he lives in New York. Okay, but it does not speak like that, it is our. Bourgeois existentialist romanticism that speaks like that, the unique and incomparable being that each of us is, but who gets ground down by the city. Black youths themselves have no personality to defend, from the outset they are defending the community. Their revolt challenges bourgeois identity and anonymity at the same time. Cool Coke. Super Strut Snake Soda Virgin The Sioux Litany, this subversive litany of anonymity, the symbolic explosion of these war names in the heart of the white city, must be heard and understood. Notes One counterfeit and reproduction always imply an anxiety, a disquieting strangeness. There is unease in front of the photograph, which has been assimilated into a sorcerer's trickery, and unease, more generally, in front of any technical equipment. Benjamin relates this to the unease bound up with the appearance of a mirror image. There is already a little sorcery at work in the mirror, but how much more there would be were the image to be detached from the mirror. Transported, stockpiled, and reproduced at whim, cf. The student of Prague, where the devil detaches the student's image from the mirror and then hunts him down through the intermediary of this image. In this way all reproduction implies maleficence, from the event of being seduced by one's own image in the water, like Narcissus, to being haunted by the double, and, who knows, even to the mortal reversal of the vast array of technical equipment that today man disguises in his own image, the narcissistic mirage of technology, as McLuhan says, and that sends back endless halting and distorted reproductions of himself and his power, to the ends of the earth. Reproduction is diabolical in its essence. Sending tremors down to our roots. This has hardly changed for us, simulation, which we describe here as the operation of the code, remains and will always remain the site of an immense project of control and death, just as the simulacrum object, the primitive statue, the image, or the photo, 
has from the outset always had black magic as its objective. 2. Furthermore, there is a flagrant contradiction in Mano's book, reflecting the ambiguity of all contemporary science. Its discourse is directed at the code, that is, at third-order simulacra, but it still follows second-order scientific schemata. Such as objectivity, the scientific ethic of knowledge, the truth principle and the transcendence of science, and so on. These things are all incompatible with third-order models of indeterminacy. 3. The weak definition of TV condemns its viewer to rearrange the few points he retains into a kind of abstract work of art. He thereby participates in the creation of a reality which is only quantalistically presented, the televiewer is in the situation of an individual who is asked to project his own phantasma onto ink blots which are not supposed to represent anything. TV as a perpetual Rorschach test. Again, the TV image obliges us to always be filling in the blanks on the screen in a convulsive, kinetic, and tactile sensory participation. For the medium is the message is even the formula of the political economy of the sign when it leads on to third order. Simulation A distinction of the medium from the message remains characteristic of second order signification. 5. The whole contemporary psychological situation is characterized by this short circuit. The emancipation of children and adolescents, after a first phase of revolt and once the principle of the right to emancipation has been established, appears to be the real emancipation of parents, youth, students, high school, pupils and adolescents, seem to sense this in their increasingly relentless, although also always unreconciled, demands that parents or educators be present and speak. Alone at last, free, and responsible, it. Page 84. Page 85. Suddenly occurs to them that in the process the others have pocketed the real freedom. Nor is there any question of simply leaving them in peace. Instead they will be plagued, not by effective or spontaneous material demands but by a demand revised and corrected by implicit edible knowledge. A hyperdependency, far greater than the other. Distorted by irony and rejection, a parody of the original libidinal mechanisms. A demand without content or reference, unfounded, but so much more ferocious for all that, a naked demand to which there is no possible response. The content of knowledge, education, or affective relations, family, the familial or pedagogic referential having been eliminated during the act of emancipation, remains nothing more than a demand bound up with the empty form of the institution, a perverse, but so much more obstinate, demand. A transferential desire, that is non or irreferential, a desire fueled by lack, by the vacant place, a liberated desire, desire caught in its own vertiginous image, a desire to Desire thereby also a visal and abim, a hyperreal desire. Stripped of symbolic substance, desire flows evermore. Intensely into its double, drawing its energy from its own reflection and from its own disillusionment. That is literally what the demand is today, and it is clear that as opposed to classical object or transference relations, this demand is insoluble and interminable. Simulated Oedipus Francois Richard writes, The students demanded to be seduced, bodily or verbally. But they are also aware of this and play their part. 
Ironically, give your knowledge and your presence, you've got the floor, so speak, that's what you're there. 4. While this is certainly a protest, that is not all it is, the more authority is contested, the more laughable it appears, the greater the demand for an authority in itself. They also play Oedipus, so as to be able to annihilate him absolutely. They say that the prof is papa for a laugh, they play at incest, discontented, untouchable, they play the tease, ultimately to be desexualist. Does the Annalisand constantly demand Oedipus, recite Oedipal tricks and have analytic dreams in order to respond to the analyst's supposed demand or to resist him? What about the student doing his Oedipus number, his seduction number, familiarly brushing up against the seductee, moving closer in order to dominate? This is not desire, however. But it's simulation, a simulated Oedipal psychodrama, but no less real or dramatic for all that. It is quite different. When there are real libidinal stakes such as knowledge and power, or even a real work of mourning over knowledge and power, as was able to take place in the universities after 68. Now is the stage of desperate reproduction, where the stakes are zero and the simulacrum at a maximum, a simulation at once aggravated and parodic, as interminable as psychoanalysis and for the same reasons. Interminable psychoanalysis. There is a whole chapter to be added to the history of the transference and the counter-transference concerning their elimination through simulation. This chapter would also deal with the insolubility of the transference and the impossibility of psychoanalysis, because it is now psychoanalysis that produces and reproduces the unconscious as its institutional substance. Psychoanalysis too dies from the exchange of unconscious signs, just as the revolution dies from the exchange of political-economic signs. This short circuit was indeed glimpsed by Freud in the form of the gift of the analytic dream or, with a prepared Annalise sand, the gift of their analytic knowledge. This was still interpreted as resistance, however, as a detour, and did not fundamentally question the analytic process or the principle of the transference. It is quite different though when the unconscious itself, the discourse of the unconscious, becomes impossible to find in accordance with the same scenario of simulatory anticipation as we have seen at work at all levels in machines of the third order. Analysis then can no longer be resolved, it becomes logically and historically interminable, since it settles on a substance that is a puppet of reproduction, an unconscious, programmed by the demand, an insurmount page. Page 85 Page 86 table instance from which the entire analysis is redistributed. Here again the unconscious's messages have been short-circuited by the medium of psychoanalysis. This is a libidinal hyperrealism. We must add the hyperreal to the celebrated categories of the real, the symbolic, and the imaginary, since it captures and redirects, perverts, the play of the three others. Six Athenian democracy, far more advanced than our own, logically came to pay for votes as a service, after having tried every other repressive solution to complete the quorum. Seven in this sense it is necessary to undertake a radical critique of Levi Strauss's extension of binary structures as 
anthropological mental structures, and dualistic organization as the basic structure of primitive societies. The dualistic form with which Levi Strauss would like to grace primitive societies is only ever our structural logic, our own code. Indeed, it is the very structure of our domination of archaic societies. Levi Strauss is kind enough to slip this to them in. The form of the mental structures common to the human race. So they will be all the better prepared to receive the Baptism of the West. 8. See also Jean-François Lyotard, De Dispositifs Pulsionals, Paris, Christian Bourgeois, 1979, pages 99,108 tr. 9. The coefficient of reality is proportionate to the reserve of the imaginary that gives it its specific weight. This is true of terrestrial as well as space exploration, when there is no more virgin, and hence available to the imaginary, territory. When the map covers the whole territory, something like the reality principle disappears. In this sense, the conquest of space constitutes an irreversible threshold on the way to the loss of terrestrial references. Reality hemorrhages to the precise extent that the limits of an internally coherent universe are infinitely pushed back. The conquest of space comes after the conquest of the planet, as the last phantasmatic attempt to extend the jurisdiction of the real, for example, when the flag, technology, and two-room apartments are carried to the moon, it is even an attempt to substantiate concepts or territorialize the unconscious, which is equivalent to the derealization of human space, or its reversal into a hyper-reality of simulation. 10. What about the cool figuration of the metallic caravan and the supermarket so beloved of the hyper-realists, or the camel soup cans dear to Andy Warhol, or even that of the Mona Lisa when it was satellite into planetary orbit as the absolute model of the Earth's art? The Mona Lisa was not even sent as a work of art, but as a planetary simulacrum where a whole world bears testimony to its existence, testifying, in reality, to its own death, for the gaze of a future universe. 11. C. Jill Deleuze and Felix Gewaitery, Anti-Oedipus, Capitalism and Schizophrenia I, T. R. R. Hurley, M. Seam and H. R. Lane, London, Athlone, 1984, and 8,000 Plateaus, Capitalism and Schizophrenia 2, T.R. Brian Masumi. London, Athlone, 1988, for the BWOTR. 12 in English in the original T.R. Page 86. Page 87. Next Section 3. Fashion, or the enchanting spectacle of the code. 